Hello and welcome to Traeger Method Oil Painting Episode 11. Coming to you from Occupied America, Portland, Oregon. A city under assault by hired thugs sent from out of town by a demented imbecile, an abject liar and criminal who is trying to distract a country he is actively killing through total incompetence and willful neglect. It is particularly offensive to be struggling to survive as an American in COVID times in a collapsed economy and be also under assault and attack by the same government the same regime that is destroying the country, killing people. It's also interesting symmetry that here's this disease that primarily attacks the respiratory system and the primary means of assault that this regime is doing on the population of my beloved city is gas and pepper balls. The amount of tear gas that is being unleashed in Portland is so extreme that the entire area around the Justice Center, if you stomp on the ground, you get tear gas in your lungs. You're, you become irritated because the ground is so saturated with this chemical dust. Well, if you didn't protest, they wouldn't be doing this. No time for bootlicking, anti-American, fascist attitudes. It's just, you know, I won't even call uh, 45, I hate using his name, the orange imbecile. To call him a fascist gives him too much credit. You know that he has some kind of organized ideology beyond grifting. Just base criminality. No, he's much more, it's been pointed out by others. It's much more just like a Banana Republic Noriega type figure, you know. Just a useful idiot. who appeals to the, the worst among us, the worst nature of our, the worst, the worst impulses in us. But this assault on our city is, I'll admit at times I'm terrified. And I will say I have never been terrified of locals Portland people, political activists in this town, though I may not subscribe to all their methods or agree with all of them, for the most part, these are people who are incredibly dedicated, very brave, and they're risking so much. I mean, just going down there as a, you know, if you go down to those protests, no matter what level of engagement you do, you're risking your health, you're risking your life, you're risking assault, you're risking legal hell. 
So, you know, even the most ardent bootlicking cop lover, if they have any honor at all, can at least acknowledge the bravery of the protesters. And if you can't, then, you know, just fuck you. You're just an asshole, you know. There's no, you know. But, I mean, these cops, you know, you think of them, it's like, oh, well, they're so brave. What? Assaulting women, old people, unarmed people, people whose primary weapon is a shield. You know, it's not a weapon. It's a defensive weapon. And then, meanwhile, you're sitting there completely geared up. These, I mean, these men are just pathetic cowards, these, these cops. I mean, really, just the the disproportionate power that they have. You know, nobody knows who they are. They have the full power of the state behind them. They're being paid, getting good benefits, a good salary. All the gear that they can have. They have endless supplies of gas and less lethal rounds. the full backing of the right-wing media world. If they get tired, if they get injured, they can take a break. And the rest of us, we're just normal people trying to survive in a country whose economy has completely collapsed and where there's a disease that is being completely allowed to run riot over the entire country. I mean, how there's not massive protests all across the country about this coronavirus disaster, it's beyond me. It really is. I mean, the United States is the very worst country on the enti- in the entire world. How's that for U.S. exceptionalism? We are number one in coronavirus deaths. Nobody's even close to us. Number one in incompetence. Number one in not having any kind of plan. Number one in not having a health care system. I mean, all these things are so obvious and can be pointed out so easily. We don't have any money for education. We don't have any money for health care. We don't have any money for anything. But when it comes to police brutalizing people, we have endless amounts. When it comes to our sending our military around the world to brutalize anyone and everyone, there's no limit. This police military industrial complex. It's just a for profit racket. It's a way of taking public money and making it private. I've been practicing self-care, re- resting, you know. You, you've, there's so much to figure out in times like this if you have any kind of conscience or care or concern for your community. Because part of me just wants to dedicate every waking minute. I... Um, to battling this idiocy, this nonsense, this violent stunt. Then I go, I'm also just a person who's sensitive and who is trying to survive and live. And you can't do it all, you know, it's not about any individual person, it's about the collective. You 
you know, as a man in America, a male identifying male man person. You know, we were inundated with these ideas in our culture of, uh, you know, the hero, the, you know, every movie's about, you know, the lone white guy saves the world, Brad Pitt saves the world, Matt Damon saves the world, the lone white guy saves the world. It's not how it works. It's collective action. It's giving yourself to something bigger than yourself. It's taking a break. It's finding... You know, there's this term diversity of tactics. That's very big. That is very necessary. You know, not everybody's cut out for all roles. Not everybody's able to do all things and all the time. You know, you can't be down on the front lines getting tear gassed every single night. I mean, maybe you can if you're 19 years old or something, but... Uh, you know, that's not me. But, you know, if you go down there to the Justice Center, you are taking your life in your hands. There's projectiles flying all over the place. Like I said, it's incredibly indiscriminate. There's also always the threat of, uh, you know, Portland has been under assault by right-wing groups for many years now, for several years. Um, you know, and so there's those people coming down to assault people as well. And I think there's going to be more of that. And so you also have to be aware of, of that threat. So you get the threat of, of the disease. You can get COVID going down there. There's too many, so many people. It's much more, it's the most socializing and social interaction I've had in months, of course, these protests and the George Floyd marches that were going on earlier in the month, the, the BLM marches. So self-care is real. Connecting with other people is real. Catharsis is very, very important. Little acts matter. I mean, today I was, you know, very, I, I, after a weekend of going down to the Justice Center, a week, I should say, it's actually more like a week, um, I found myself completely exhausted today. Just, I slept, I napped for, I don't know, five hours. And that was after getting a full night's sleep. And then I woke up, you know, at six, that kind of horrible feeling when you wake up from a nap and it's beginning to be night, you know, it's just very disconcerting. And I had just insane pant uh, stress dreams the entire time. So I felt very, very disconcerted, so I went to called a friend, went for a walk, met up with my partner, girlfriend, and our dog, and we went for a walk, and then she's very wise, kind, intelligent, and uh, supportive person. So we talked for a while and felt much better. And while I was at her place, a small caravan of cars, she lives on a circle, and a small caravan of Black Lives Matter cars went around the circle, honking and holding signs, and, you know, I don't know, six cars, a couple mopeds, not some huge group. But just that, I went out on the porch and waved at them, and they waved back as they went by, and, uh, you know, just that little interaction, that little show of solidarity, of effort, of intention, it added to that feeling of relief that I had in talking with her. You know, because I mean, I live in a city, Portland, where anywhere you go, you look in a window of a house, you know, every other house has a Black Lives Matter sign, chalk on the sidewalk. You know, it is a very concerned and conscientious place. And, you know, I love this city now more than I ever have. This has been my home for many years. I'm from the Northwest originally. 
but I grew up closer to the Seattle area, even though my family has major roots in Portland and the Willamette Valley. But I've actually called Portland my home now for going on, I don't know, 17, 18 years. And, um, and I've always liked it, but you know, it's got a, it's, it's always had a rap of, uh, oh, you know, just comfortable liberals and so pleased with themselves. But then you see a time like this where the, you know, um, the shit hits the fan and you really see like, oh, this city has a real community, deep roots and a culture that is, you know, profoundly against fascism. We just don't like it here. We don't like Nazis. You know, Portland has been a very Nazi city in the past. I mean, when I was a kid, a punk rock kid in Seattle, Portland had a real reputation as, you know, one of those towns. But it's changed a lot, and and this city is profoundly against that as a culture. Deeply, deeply anti-Republican. Pro-environmentalism. Pro-justice. Imperfect, sure. But I am very, very proud and very, very... Yeah, just very proud to be a part of this culture in this city. You know, we're standing up to a pretty withering assault right now by this group of thugs and it's only going to get worse they're ratcheting it up there's federal reinforcements are coming in and these aren't reinforcements because these guys are getting worn out or hurt this is just more reinforcements because it's not working you know they're they're not intimidating people we're not we're not backing down so they're sending in more to try and crush us that's what it is it's not this is not reinforcements because these guys are getting you know sent out in stretchers. I mean, frankly, I wish some of them would get sent out in stretchers. They deserve it. You know, they're sending us out in stretchers, so it's, it, you know, yeah, that's, I don't feel uncomfortable saying that at all. These guys deserve everything that they get because they're awful, awful dudes and very, very cowardly. I don't know how they can, I mean, it's a very, it's hard to imagine how these people can sleep at night. Like you go home and hug your kids after gassing other people's parents and beating the shit out of them. And I mean, I'm not speaking from some, uh, you know, uh, I'm speaking from firsthand accounts, knowing the situation very intimately experiencing this city and here's the deal the city is doing just fine everybody's doing okay here you know this place is not under any kind of assault by some you know this this the very notion that the city is in chaos because of anarchists it's like portland anarchists are like a major part of the they're just they're just a, a, an aspect of the culture here i mean they work at their baristas they're you know, they're, they work at the grocery stores. They just, you know, this is just, these are just people, self-defense groups. The city is, is beautiful actually in the summer. I mean, if you, if you walk around a normal neighborhood in Portland, you wouldn't know anything was going on other than the fact that there are Black Lives Matter signs in every window and chalk art on the ground. And there's graffiti. There's way more graffiti than there ever has been. But that was also true. That's also true just generally. You know, there's just more graffiti. And if a 
I mean, graffiti is the main thing that you notice in this town. Same thing with the assault on the courthouse. It's mostly an assault of graffiti. That courthouse, that uh, downtown that's the focus of this, where the, all the battles are taking place, that thing, you could not burn that down. You could not wreck it if you had a... F I mean, it is a fortress of concrete. There's no... I mean, this idea... I've heard, you know, right-wing liars have said, you know, that uh, they firebombed it. I mean, we're talking about little campfire size fires at the base of a massive reinforced concrete structure. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just nonsense. Utter nonsense. I'm painting this uh, painting here. This is one of those little panel paintings. Got my mall stick. That's that piece of bamboo. M-A-H-L. That's a mall stick. Rest your hand on it so you don't touch the canvas or the panel in this case. That's what that is. Mushrooms coming out of a coffin. I think a lot about death and um, and these events that I'm talking about you know they make you think about death too because you could die it's not dramatic to say that you know I mean Donovan Lavella local Portland young person was shot in the face deliberately by the cops you know they just straight up lowered their guns at him and blasted him in the face while he hold a, held a speaker above his head it was a very deliberate attempt to maim, injure deeply, perhaps kill him. I would be surprised if this level of pitched battles went on for another week or two, that I would be surprised if no one dies. These goons are obviously very untrained. I mean, I've read about who they are. They are untrained. There was a memo from Homeland Security saying they, they do not have training in crowd control. So it's a very dangerous situation. You have untrained, violent, well-armed, probably people who are selected for their ideological adherence to fascist tendencies. You have them in a very high stress situation. These are, you know, assholes with guns, assholes with uh, riot control stuff. So, you know, anything can happen with these mm. creeps. So death is is part of this. But you know, the other thing is like it's it's really about life. You know, it's life and death. Because, you know, another thing that we, I think, understand, many of us, is that if power is retained by the GOP, it's the end of organized life on Earth. I mean, how can it not be? You're going to leave the Paris Accord climate treaty as soon as the election's over, if it happens. I mean, if America is completely lost, that's it. You know, there's there's no going back. Climate catastrophe the, will be sealed. Your children will have no future. So you got to fight. You have to fight. And, you know, it's also given me a lot of empathy. And I've always had empathy, but I have even more now, much more visceral empathy for black and brown people in this country what they've endured forever you know the stress the 
the um, oxytocin. Is that the one? No, is that, is that the bonding one or the what's the what's the one? The stress. It's really the um, fight or flight chemical. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're bathing in it all the time when you're under assault by authorities. And when you, you know, there's something uh, you know, when the state is arrayed against you, it's very disturbing. And as a white you know, person raised by a middle class, inner middle class kind of family you remember the middle class? That was a thing that used to exist in America. Um, you know, I've been spared for the most part. You know, I've been spared state repression and the threat of imprisonment and death at the hands of police, injury at the hands of police. It hasn't affected me much. But you feel it very viscerally when you go down there. You feel it very, very viscerally, and you feel, you know, the paranoia around knowing that they're surveilling the city and they're gathering data and they're, you know, gathering data on social media, they're gathering data on cell phones, they're gathering data on movements, you know, this is a surveillance state. And it's a police state. It's very frightening. It's very depressing. And it gives me that much more admiration for black and brown people, what they go through. They still create art. They still create so much that enriches all of our lives. We really don't deserve it as white people. We really do not deserve it. And if I can do a small part to help in the fight for justice and equality and you know on behalf of those people and myself I'm I'm totally in you know and if you find yourself disagreeing with my take and wanting to write a comment that says you know I mean I'm sure this will probably be watched by five people who cares you know but but if uh, you know, if that was the case, you know, I don't have any interest in con in converting assholes. You know, just this is just not something that I specialize in. You know, I don't really feel like that's a thing anymore. You know, just like if you're if you at this point after this incompetent, imbecile, moron, liar you know, has overseen this completely humiliating botched response to COVID. If you still are like on board with that, then there's nothing to say to you. You know, you're fully propagandized. You're a nitwit. You're just a fool, you know? I mean, really, it's like mentally ill or a fool. Um, something like along those, that lines, those lines. And, you know, I don't make art for you. I don't make... You know, be well. Hope you don't hurt anyone. But uh, nothing to do with you. You know, I make art for catharsis for and for people who are cool. You know, it's like I make music. I make art for to help boost up people who are working for good things in this world. You know, preaching to the converted? Yeah, let's do that. Let's preach to the converted. Let's let the converted know that they're not alone. You know, a huge part of what our society teaches us, like I was talking about with, you know, movies about the lone white hero. You know, one of the myths of America is this idea, or one of the disempowering things about it is this idea that any collective action is 
anti-American. You know, you, you're an individual. You should just have a gun and protect your little patch of land. Screw everyone else. If they are suffering, it's because they deserve it. And if you suffer, it's because you deserve it. And everybody should just, it's just this sadomasochistic, bizarre clusterfuck of a philosophy. It's just so wrong on so many levels. And you really see its uh, inherent weakness in like our response to the COVID thing. You know, we can't look out for each other, right? We're, we're not going to tell me to wear a mask. I don't like the way it feels, so therefore I, you know, makes me feel like a lady to take care of myself and care about others. I don't want to do it. I have a gun. I'm a boy. It's like, Jesus Christ, you know, grow up. So, you know, one of the things that we're learning in this experience is like, man, collective shit is where it's at. You got to join forces with other people. You need support with other people. You need community. You need all different kinds of people. You need to take strength and give strength to others, from others, to others. To share resources. The other option, it's just a death trip, you know, it just is. Like, it, it, this, you know, there's a reason that oil companies fund so much policing and that corporations are so into cops, you know. Because it's like the, the cop thing is well funded in America because it protects, you know, it's security for rich people paid for by the public. Yeah, but you'd be the first one to call cops if, you know. Well, it's like, I mean, I have called the cops before. I saw a guy laying on the street. I thought he was dead. I don't know who else to call. I wish I could have called somebody else. You know, some social services. It wasn't a case that you needed a guy with a gun to show up. We need to defund, reduce, demilitarize the police. And we need to tax billionaires tax corporations, tax the wealthy so that this country can provide something other than police to brutalize people. Like, if that's the only thing we can afford, you know, we need more money. We need more money. You know, it's uh, an absolute obscenity that Jeff Bezos, you know, made $10 billion in one day last week. That's just, that's cancer. You see that, right? That's cancer. That's, that's a quickly metastasizing tumor. That's not a, a success story. That's a bizarre aberration, and it's a disease. That's COVID spreading in your lungs, right? I met a painter down at the protest. His Instagram handle is the Night Painter. 
check him out. He's a plain air painter, oils he works with. Plain air is means you, know, you paint outside. Something I've rarely ever done. I paint watercolors outside occasionally, like if I'm on vacation or something, I'll bring watercolors with me because I like to paint, you know, all the time. I don't have an oil painting setup. I do want to join him on the front lines painting. I did take my brushes down, my my watercolor setup down to the protest yesterday. Did a couple little sketches. But he's down there doing, you know, you know, pretty good sized canvases and panels and stuff. We're going to set up a, there's been, you know, depending on your level of, you know, the funny thing is like I'm talking like, uh, you know, I'm, again, this is probably being watched by, you know, a handful of people who are from where I live probably. So, but, but I'm, I guess I'm, I just need to treat this as though. People from other places are watching. There are people that I don't personally know are watching this. It's possible, I guess. Maybe in the future. I don't know. But uh, I've noticed that as I've done these videos, it's very satisfying when you see, you know, the first video has 35 views. The next one has 25 views. The next one has 20 until the last one had seven. And I was like, okay, we're doing, this is typically how things go with in my experience of things that I make it's like uh, it's just funny yeah whatever saw my friend the comic oh anyways back to the night I've got, no let me just it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be linear I saw a tweet by my friend Ben Harkins who's a very very funny comic and uh, he said okay here's my to-do list first you know survive COVID second survive fascist attack third get back to my miserable dead in life um that's yeah it, it can feel that way as an artist for sure you know because as an artist like i've always felt like oh homelessness is my destiny you know there's no how to, i don't know how to survive i've always done it by the skin of my teeth and you know You know, an artistic career is ill-advised if you're not uh, from money. You know, if you're from money, then, yeah, be, let your freak flag fly. Otherwise, you have to be, you know, you weed out the most, uh, you know, the most, uh, you weed out the undedicated ones in the 20s and 30s. You know, when you get to 50 and you're still doing it and uh, not making any money, um, it's the hardcore. I take that as a point of pride. But my hero is always William Blake, right? So he died penniless and, you know. So. I'm embracing that. But just because it's a dead end life, I mean, all lives are dead end. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? You die, right? So. I don't know. If you die with a big boat and a couple jet skis in your garage, is that a victory? I don't, you know, maybe to some people. Not to me. Um, yeah, back to the night painter. Uh, I was very impressed with what he was doing, and he's a very nice guy. So we're going to do some stuff together. Art matters. I mean, just having him there painting, you could see that people would see that. And and it reminds you, like, oh, yeah, our side, the side that's not geared up like we're going to war in a combat zone, you know, these ridiculous outfits they're wearing, the thugs. You know, our side has, what, food, 
you know, Riot Ribs is down there giving away free food, as much as you can eat. You have people dancing, doing performance art, you know, Naked Athena, you might have seen her. We have painters, there's musicians, we have a drum line, we have artists, philosophers, poets. We've got the full battery of humanity on our side. That's what's being assaulted, that's what's being attacked. Our group is made up of nurses and teachers and mothers and fathers and you know these are just these are the people and you know if you watch this footage and you delight in seeing cops brutalizing these people you're on a really different trip you know and if you see it and it makes your blood boil and you have a unspeakable rage towards these bullies then you know I can dig you you're cool Because, I mean, the, the reason why Trump, oh, there I said his name, I'm sorry, the orange imbecile, the reason he picked Portland is because we're a small, liberal city. You know, one of the smallest major cities in America. Of course he's going to, I mean, this guy has a utterly cowardly bully, you know. Just a soft-handed, silver spoon dipshit, you know, who you know, he's never this guy's never swung a punch in his life, you know he's never had to defend himself physically from anything ever the weakest, softest most you know this, this guy's you know, he knows more about hairspray and foundation than, you know, a, a beautician. It is incredible that all these, like, men consider him like some kind of macho figure. It's completely, again, you know, he is a skilled con artist and a skilled entertainer. You know, he has a very strange appeal to a certain kind of person, you know. You know, I think one of the things he just really, you know, it's just the GOP in general, it's a coalition of assholes, you know, that really does seem to be the main thing that bonds them all together, is like we're all assholes, we're all selfish, and we're, we're dicks, and we lie about everything. You know, always. Everything has to be a lie and a hoodwink and trickery in a game. And, you know, it's just... You know, let's say we lose and everything goes to hell and it's, you know... And I still will feel strongly that, like, well, at least I was on the right... You know, what party do you want to be on at the, at, at the end of time? You know, do you want to be chomping a cigar with Rush Limbaugh? Would you rather be down in the streets with the people doing, you know, fighting the good fight? I always, I like normal people and, and weirdos and misfits and people who struggle and, you know. When I see a homeless person, I, I can relate to a homeless person, um, a houseless individual, a million times more than I can relate to some, you know. Betsy DeVos, some heir to a fortune. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see myself in those people whatsoever. I mean, it's completely foreign to me. A guy pushing a shopping cart down the street, I go there, but for a few quirks of fate go I, you know. <clears throat> I 
I've been thinking about uh, my own like tendencies to isolate and be an artistic hermit. You know, as a painter, you know, I used to I used to focus on stand-up comedy. That was my main career uh, artistic pursuit for a number of years actually kind of stopped that pre-COVID, which was very fortunate for me, but uh, because that disappeared, of course, as an art form. Um, but as a painter, you know, I'm just, I just love to just isolate and just be alone working and listening to podcasts or you know, watching documentaries and being in my own world and But, um, and I just, you know, I don't know if it was, I was raised by a military brat, you know, my mom. And, you know, she had the ability to, you know, she would, could move on from things, you know, like you leave one place and you go to the next and you set up again. We lived in a lot of different houses and stuff. And she was really good at that, making a house a home and stuff, but you know, and I don't know that this has anything to do with my upbringing, but, you know, I have that ability where, like, a chapter closes in my life and I move on and I don't really spend a ton of time looking back or, you know, fostering connections with people. You know, you might see see them in the past and or in on Facebook or, or you know, I don't look at Facebook, but, um, you know, you might see them on social media now and then, but... You know, I'm not the kind of person I never make time to stay in touch and maintain those relationships. I kind of just move on to the new ones and, you know, and I tend to have a small circle of close friends and don't really do a lot of co communicating with other people. And I feel like I want to change that, you know. I, I've been thinking, like, I want to, you know, each day along with some political activism some actions in that respect. I also want to do some personal activism and say, hey, let's just reach out to somebody and tell them you care. Because I know when somebody does that to me, I'm very moved by that. Like, wow, you thought of me and you took the time to write me. That's so nice and it makes me feel so good. And, you know, and the same thing about, you know, being an unfamous artist, a non, you know... I mean, I've always, you know, as a musician and artist, I've never achieved any kind of like fame or accolades. So I, you know, I don't ever take like fandom or admiration lightly. You know, it's never something that's like, oh, thank you. You know, it's like amazing to me when people write me or contact me and tell me they love what I do or, you know, I am so appreciative of it. It's, uh, you know, mind bending. And when, uh, you know, when I did do comedy and I would get great response and people would come to me after the show and, you know, say, Oh, that just made my night. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. You know, to me, that's just like, I can't even tell you how much that matters, you know? So that's what I'm getting at is like, I want to do more of that myself towards other people randomly take the time or not randomly. That's a lazy word, but, um, you know, when I feel that way towards something I see, take the time to, to let that person know. You know, I loved what you did. I love what you do. This is hilarious. This is beautiful. Whatever. Take the time to let them know. And reach out to a friend, you know, some old friend that you haven't been in touch with. I'm talking about myself right now. You know, take the time to just send them a postcard, write them a letter, give them a call. Tell them they mean something to you, you know. I mean, even in the best circumstances, we could be dead tomorrow. You know, you could just, your brain can explode and just, that's it. You know, so take the time to foster those connections. Because it's not about atomization and individual, and individual trips and ego centric nonsense and celebrity culture and all that kind of just crap all that's just forget about it who cares 
It's about mutual aid. It's about helping one another. It's about pitching in. Because these you know, sociopathic tendencies in our culture, these obscene billionaires, these oligarchs, and their minions, you know, the people who are followers and fans of these wretched people. Now, that's a whole different trip. It's a whole different philosophy. It's not the community I'm a part of. I mean, it's not a community. <laughs> that's the other thing. It's like, it's not. So... It was a pretty long episode, and uh, didn't talk a lot about painting, which is fine. But I did talk about the role of the artist, you know, in culture. And um, you know, if you're watching this, if you've watched, you know, if, I mean, obviously, if you're hearing my words right now, you've watched this. You're you are watching this, right? You have to be, in, or you maybe you're not watching. Maybe you're just listening, and that's totally legit too. I haven't really been paying much attention to what's been going on on the screen while I've been talking. I mean, I've been looking at it, but I haven't really been thinking about it. Um, but I just want to say, you know, thank you. Like, really, really thank you from the bottom of my heart. Not just for watching this, but for being a person who's curious who's who's interested i mean i can't imagine you've watched this if you're not a cool person you know what i mean like you you are a cool person you're awesome you know um i've been thinking i just want to say that you are a fucking awesome person Whatever your faults, whatever your character your flaws, you are an awesome person. You know, I was talking with a friend today, and at some point she says she said something about that she's a piece of shit. You know, she's like, "Well, I'm just a piece of shit," and she was, you know, whatever. You know, it's kind of jokey, but I but I said, you know, really, like, don't say that too much about yourself, like. You know what I mean? Like you just like, I guess cause, cause when I'm watching like true pieces of shit, you know, like these, like, like the president of the United States is a piece of shit, like an absolutely unredeemable, just, you know, yeah, is just vile scum. And so when you, when a friend of mine says, I'm a piece of shit, it's like, no, you're not even close to a piece of shit. And you are, have been conned into thinking of yourself that way by a society that is, you know, 50-50 at best, complete garbage. And a philosophy that is just literally leading us towards the end of the world, which is capitalism, late stage consumer capitalism. You know, I mean, we are doomed if this is the best we can do. So, you know, don't fall into that propaganda. You know, I think about my own life and how many times I've wanted to commit suicide or, you know, just thought, like, let's just do this. Let's end it. What's the point? I have nothing to offer and I don't care about, you know, living. What's the point? It's just suffering for no reason and it all is just going to end in climate catastrophe. Um, but then I get to this place and I go, well, I'm glad I'm still here to fight. I'm honored. I was marching down to the justice center in a big, huge group of about 2000 people. And the other night, and 
And I was so glad and so honored to be a part of that group and that company. And, I, and if I had killed myself in 1998, you know, I wouldn't have been there. So you have to survive. You have to love yourself. At least just allow yourself to be human and get off of this negative self-talk and get into some self-love and love for others. Thank you.